Greetings, uh, I'm Richard Doyle, uh, creating this video log for Reality Sandwich Reread of Vallis. Uh, thanks to Jeremy Johnson for inviting me. I'm uh, transmitting to you from uh, central Pennsylvania as the spring unfolds and the slick, cyclic and uh, total nature of absolute reality manifests through our material existence. And we can hear it in the bird song and see it in the opening of the violets. And Philip K. Dick, the writer that we're going to talk about today, um, saw it through kind of a brief opening that he had into the eternal aspect of all things, uh, in which he saw, as he put it, the world under the species of eternity, like the philosopher Spinoza, like Plotinus, like Meister Eckhart, who we'll talk about a little bit. But he did it in the form of a science fiction novelist writing in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, predominantly. Uh, I've I've uh, been teaching Philip K. Dick's works since around 1994 here at Penn State University. Um, I wrote the afterword to the uh, exegesis that was edited by uh, Pamela Jackson and Jonathan Leeson. I'd be happy to share with you a copy, a PDF copy of the afterword of the exegesis, as it is under my copyright, so I can uh, freely exchange it to anybody who wants it. Uh, no need uh, for any compensation there. And um, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Vallis and in response to some of the questions that uh, Jeremy has been kind enough to forward to me. So uh, I'll uh, keep track of the time here and uh, um, entertain some of those questions uh, one by one. So uh, the first question that Jeremy asked uh, focused on what I mentioned in the afterwards to the exegesis as the shamanic character of uh, Dick's writing, its ability to uh, induce reality distortion. Uh, and he wondered if I thought that that was true uh, of Vallis as well. And in fact, I think Vallis is among the most effective in that category, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why. Um, let me say a little bit what I mean first by uh, this shamanic power. Uh, one of the things that happens when you read D Philip K. Dick's novels in particular, it seems to me, is that you start to experience in an uncanny way, almost sometimes a creepy or weird way, the dissolution between the world of the novel and the world of your ordinary existence. You start to experience the non-boundary between yourself and the novel. Now, of course, what you're experiencing when you're experiencing that is your own consciousness. You're experiencing the way in which it is your consciousness that brings the fictional world of Ubik or of Vallis or of Three Stigmata Palmer Eldritch into being and it is your consciousness that brings the uh, material world into being as you perceive it and experience it. Uh, as the writer uh, Robert Anton Wilson put it, you know, you are the magician who makes the grass green, right? It is your experience of consciousness that you are always experiencing. And Dick had the uh, ability to sort of uh, have that leak through to a reader uh, in a way that I haven't seen uh, any other novelist uh, really capable of, any other philosophical or literary writer really capable of it. Now, how was he able to do that? Um, one way it seems to me that Jeremy picks up on in the first question is this idea of multiple authorship, right? That we can become lured into a sense of having a very sturdy boundary between the fiction of Vallis and our own reality by focusing on the idea, for example, that horse lover Fat, who is a character in the uh, novel Vallis, is a thinly veiled pseudonym for Philip K. Dick, which it is. Uh, but then, in focusing on that, so Fat is the artificial character that Philip K. Dick invents in order to, as he puts it, write from the perspective of much needed objectivity. He says he needs to view his own life as if from a third person perspective in order to experience this, what he calls, much needed ob objectivity. But what's interesting is that if we go slowly and we see that uh, uh, it is the character, Philip K. Dick, in Vallis, who says that he needs the much needed objectivity, we can begin to notice something very peculiar, which is not only is Horse Lover Fat a character, but of course, so is Philip K. Dick a character in the novel Vallis. And there's no particular reason why the, the character Philip K. Dick ought to have any greater purchase 
or reality quotient than the character Horse Lover Fat. In other words, Philip K. Dick is just as much of a character as Horse Lover Fat is. And when we pursue this idea of the, uh, Philip K. Dick as a character in Vallis coming to experience himself as a character, we can start to come to experience ourselves as a character as well. We can start to experience ourselves as a tiny sliver of awareness that is associated with this label, say Richard Doyle or Mobius or Philip K. Dick. And that this label becomes so effective and fixed that we begin to believe that that's what we are. But by engaging in Dick's world where the multiple authorship makes it uncertain exactly who is speaking in the book, we become uncertain of just exactly who we are as the boundary between the book and ourselves begins to break down. Here, uh, Dick is resonant with uh, somebody who I don't think he ever wrote, but ever read, but who is uh, very uh, intriguing along these lines is the writer Wei Wu Wei, uh, who was another pseudonym, it was, it was a pseudonym actually for uh, a writer named Stanislav Gray. He wrote some books under the uh, authorship Wei Wu Wei, W-E-I, W-U, uh, W-E-I, I believe. And uh, one of the uh, sort of epigrams or, or uh, aphorisms that uh, Wei Wu Wei has in his books is one that says, why are you unhappy? Because 99% of everything you think and everything that you, you say and everything that you do is for yourself. And there isn't one, he says. And this experience of the uh, falsehood, the, the, the fictional character of the self uh, as Philip K. Dick or as Richard Doyle or as Horse Lover Fat is the experience that Vallis is about, right? That the novel Vallis uh, narrates Dick's experience of, the, of what he called pure consciousness leaking through what he thought was his ordinary reality. And over the course of the next eight years between 1974 and 1982, from the time of the first, what he calls at first, invasions or incursions of Vallis, into ordinary reality, into his uh, experience, uh, Dick comes to realize uh, that, in fact, what is false is not the world uh, so much as his self, that it is the self that is blocking the full Monty of absolute reality from leaking into his experience, and that by letting go even a moment in a moment of total pain as he was is in, as he was in when he had his first experience of Vallis, waiting for delivery from the pharmacy to bring him pain relieving medication, Darvon after he'd had oral surgery. Or if it's in a moment of literary fascination when we come to realize that, that we ourselves are nothing but a character and that that nothing but a character is actually a superficial epiphenomenal treatment of a very uh, immense and even eternal as aspect of reality that can leak through. And we can experience that leaking through and in experiencing that leaking through we experience, we even reenact what Dick was experiencing and what he called the leaking through of the vast active living intelligence system or Vallis. So, uh, Vallis is, in a sense, not even really a novel, then, in my, in my view. It's really a pointer to the exegesis, which is Dick's long working through of this problem of just who Philip K. Dick was. And I say problem as if it was a kind of negative thing, but it's not really a negative thing. It's just he's working through his superficial nature in order to discover his true nature. And when he experienced a nanosecond of an inkling of the leaking through of what he called the pink light, the full Monty of absolute reality into this very partial incarnated material form of reality in which uh, we live inside of a web of symbols uh, and, and infrastructure, um, when he began to experience that, he called it uh, pure consciousness. And it's really what the sage and California philosopher and mathematician 
Franklin Merrill Wolf called consciousness without an object. That what Dick was able to experience, if just for a moment, in a nanosecond, was that consciousness in its full potential, it's devoid of any content whatsoever, and in some paradoxical way includes all content. And so if we can, uh, going along with one of the Psalms uh, in the Old Testament, be still, then we can experience what Wolf called consciousness without an object. Uh, and it's uh, my point of view, my argument in the afterward to the exegesis, uh, my teaching uh, in the classes that I offer, such as uh, Radio Free Vallis, uh, available online for free, that this is precisely what Dick was exploring, was the uh, experience that is behind any particular content of consciousness and the full plenum of consciousness that resides uh, behind material reality. So that material reality asserted itself most assertively about a half hour ago because I was filming this and uh, really experiencing the way in which uh, uh, the absolute can leak through this apparently uh, material reality as I was dissolving myself uh, and allowing Vallis to speak through me. And what was very interesting is when I got up to uh, 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 you know, take the camera after probably a 45 minute uh, recording, the camera was not working and it stopped working. So I'm going to check again to see if it works. Whoops. Material reality asserts itself. So uh, what was interesting about that is, is that that experience of getting out of the way and allowing what Dick sometimes called the noosphere or Vallis to speak through them is available to all of us. And it's in fact the uh, instruction that, of all people, Jesus gives to his disciples in the New Testament for when they are to speak, when they are to get in contact with what uh, PKD called the Logos. And uh, he said, take no care or premeditate beforehand, uh, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Ghost. And I think we could even interpret that as not you that speak, but Vallis. And Vallis the novel and uh, the exegesis which Vallis the novel points to uh, is really a pointing to letting the eye, releasing the eye, and letting what is behind the eye manifest. Letting go of what it is that we think that we're doing and let manifest what the, uh, is, is beyond this superficial label that we characterize, uh, characterize ourselves as. And when we begin to do that, we can even feel a kind of energy that Dick pointed to as the pink light or, or as Vala, something tremendous and much greater in magnitude than our narrow temporal material self could ever experience. And that's the good side of the Wei Wu Wei uh, aphorism, which is that everything we do and everything we say and everything we think is for the self, this I thought, and it doesn't exist. It is itself the fictional character. Just as Horse Lover Fat is a fictional character. Just as Phil K. Dick is a fictional character. But when we can release it as a fictional character, rather than the void or something being missing, we experience this incredible, well-nigh ecosystem of being that is uh, underneath and beyond uh, our I thought. And beginning to experience that, uh, is really, I think, what occurred to Philip K. Dick, and he was in a kind of commuting relationship with this pure consciousness that he wrote about uh, in the exegesis. So that's where I think this well-nigh shamanic character of uh, Philip K. Dick's work comes from, is that he's able to occupy this kind of liminal space, this between space between his I thought, his self, and the full nature of pure consciousness that his self emerges out of. So it's almost as if he's going back and forth between this experience of pure consciousness and then putting it into language in a way to share it with us so that we can reenact that experience of pure consciousness. Now it's also true that he seemed to get sort of addicted to trying to put it into language. And language, uh, as many linguists and philosophers have noted, is, uh, with the exception of a few, like apparently the Hopi language and a few other languages, is devoted to this kind of subject-object relation. It presupposes 
that things can be put into categories, that things are separate from these from each other, right? There is myself over here, there's the camera over there. And this idea of separation is very useful for interacting with material re reality and manipulating material reality. And indeed, we can go back to Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, and note the emergence of this idea of putting everything into categories, such as science fiction, or religious text, or metaphysical text, or author, or human being. But that these categories are just useful labels, but they're so useful, and they're so powerful, like linguistic labels in general, that we become convinced by them. And we actually believe that somehow we are separate from each other, and that we are separate from the environment within which we live, and that we are separate from the Godhead out of which we have manifested from Phil K. Dick's point of view and my own. And so, uh, you know, 70,000 years into using language, we've become kind of encrusted by it. It's, it's a kind of necrotic experience that we've mistaken the interface for reality itself, where the interface is that linguistic model that we live within. And Dick, along with Wei Wu Wei, and along with many of the writers of the perennial philosophy, the name that Aldous Huxley gave to what he sees as the common strand in all the global metaphysical traditions, are constantly trying to point us to the fact that we are living within this necrotic, encrusted, linguistic, symbolic reality. And that if just for a moment we will get still or realize the relative and fictional nature of that fictional reality, we will be able to experience the absolute nature of reality out of which the linguistic and the technological will emerge. And that's what Dick's work is really a training in, and that's what I'm going to share with you. Now, Jeremy asked me why, uh, of all the chapters, I would want to share uh, chapter 11 with you. Uh, and um, in part, it was due to an act of bibliomancy which means uh, it goes back to uh, the great perennial philosopher Augustine of Hippo, or St. Augustine, who uh, had this occur when he opened the Bible. The Bible seemed to speak to him directly. Uh, and Dick's work is very powerful in this way that you can sort of open it anywhere and allow it to speak to you in the way in which he used, uh, same way in which he used the I Ching. And so uh, when Jeremy asked me this, I opened to uh, page 174 of chapter 11, and I'll just read to you from that. Uh, the Ripidon Society has traveled north to Sonoma County because they've realized that there are other people who have experienced this leaking in of what they call ballast into material reality. And of course, the irony of it called, being called leaking in is the idea that in fact, it is what is. The uh, oneness that is beyond categorization, just as book, Dick's books are beyond categorization, is the true nature of reality, and the fictional categorization and labeling of it is where we end up living. And so this is 174 of the vintage edition. Shortly we were squeezed into the rabbit, rabbit being of course the Volkswagen made in the 1970s, but also pointing to the kind of Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland character of the world that these characters are pl plunging into when they arrive in Sonoma County, where they find that the people that agree with them, that the people that have also experienced this leak of absolute reality into their own, are completely crazy. Shortly we're squeezed into the rabbit sailing down residential streets of relatively modern houses with wide lawns. We are the Ripidon Society, Fat said. Eric Lampton said, we are the friends of God. Amazed, Kevin reacted violently. He stared at Eric Lampton. The rest of us wondered why. You know the name then, Eric said. Gottesfreunde, Kevin said. You go back to the 14th century. That's right, Lampton Lampton said. The Friends of God formed originally in Basel, perhaps coincidentally the place where, in 1943, Albert Hoffman discovered slash invented uh, LSD. Finally, we entered Germany and the Netherlands. You know of Meister Eckhart then. Meister Eckhart, of course, being the Rhineland mystic of the 14th century, who uh, experienced something incredibly resonant with what Dick uh, experienced in terms of the uh, what he called pure consciousness, the leaking into his fake reality of pure consciousness. Uh, Eckhart, uh, Plotinus, Spinoza, 
Jacob Bohm, Shankara, who we'll talk about in a minute. Dick is having recourse to all of these global thinkers in order to try to understand what had happened to him. And what he learns is that what he thought was an enormously, you know, a unique experience, in fact, happens over and over and over to different people who are willing to open their mind to the possibility that material reality is not all that is, and that what they're living inside of is a linguistic framework, but there is something much larger. Kevin said he was the first person to conceive of the Godhead in distinction to God. Now, Eckhart was not, it's, this is an arguable point that sometimes is represented in the history of philosophy, but the idea of the distinction of the Godhead in contradistinction to God is the idea that there is something that Paul Tillich, the theologian, called the God beyond God, something out of which God itself emerges as a personification, that our brain, our mind likes to interact with personification because that's its favored interface that we've evolved in. But that if we look carefully even at these personified beings, we see beyond it is what is named in the Old Testament as pure being. I am that I am. I am pure being is what Yahweh is pointing to. Being itself is what PKD experienced and what uh, Eckhart pointed to. We had never heard Kevin so excited. The soul can actually know God as he is. Nobody today teaches that. Kevin just didn't know. Many people teach the perennial philosophy today. It is available uh, in, from, in writers from the Flemish mystic John of Roisbrecht to Evelyn Underhill in the 20th century to the afterwards of the exegesis to Philip K. Dick. This is perhaps the most common, in fact, point of view on the relationship between the Godhead and human beings and is represented in Luke 17, 21, the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus points out that the kingdom of heaven is within you. Kevin stammered. We had never heard him stammer before. Shankara in India in the ninth century, he taught the same things Eckhart taught. It's a trans-Christian mysticism in which man can reach beyond God or merge with God or with a spark of some kind that isn't created. Brahman, that's why zebra, valus, er Eric Lampton said. Whatever, Kevin said. And it's that one ever that is the point where I think Dick realizes and is pointing to the fact that the labels are just that, labels. That what Vallis is a teaching in, what exege the exegesis is a teaching in, is a way of experiencing that which is beyond this relative domain of linguistic reality and is in fact uh, the domain of pure reality that he called Vallis. So, last question I think that Jeremy asked me to uh, respond to is this idea of, you know, what other novels and short stories and so forth uh, would I recommend? Well, first thing I would recommend is if you're interested in Vallis, go to zebrapedia.psu.edu where the full true copy of the um, eight to 9,000 page write-up that Dick had of his experience of pure consciousness exists. And that's where you can see played out this kind of habitual toing and froing between the experience of pure consciousness and the attempt to put it into the subject-object domain of language where things are separated. I think Dick actually ex uh, uh, achieves that. He achieves the ability to help us experience the domain of pure consciousness even in the subject domain of language. So if you go to zebrapedia.psu.edu, if you go to Radio Free Vallis, where I discuss Ubik, Scanner, a Scanner Darkly, the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, and Vallis, you can see that it is in those novels, and particularly the Vallis trilogy, Divine Invasion, Radio Free Albemuth, the Trans Transmigration of Timothy Archer, uh, that these texts are really pointing to this experience of pure consciousness. And that if we just stop at this moment of feeling like Dick is pointing to the fake nature of reality, which he is, we will not move beyond that experience of the fake nature of reality to the ability that we have to experience the absolute reality that is behind it, out of which it has come into being. Uh, this is what Dick called our ability to get into contact with the Logos, or the Noosphere, and he points to uh, the opening of the Gospel of John, where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. There he's pointing to something transcendental 
even to God, transcendental to ourselves, and it's something that we can experience if we will tune in to the word of Philip K. Dick. Thank you very much. If you'd like to ask me any questions, please feel free to do so at Mobius, M-O-B-I-U-S, at PSU.edu. I'm also available uh, on Skype, Haptic Lattice, at Skype. And uh, let's get in touch and let's grow this community of pure consciousness. Thank you.